we got access to some very special guests here. Uh, and we thought what we would do is kind of take a unique look at 2012 in the uh, Twin Cities beer scene and also kind of look forward at 2013 to see what, what's on the horizon. So very special guest with us tonight. Chip Walton used to work for Northern Brewer Brewing TV, uh, also writes for Edible Twin Cities. Uh, is the founder and owner of uh, choppingbrew.com. That's right. So he came to talk about the home brewing scene, about beer in the media, and also to videotape this uh, event for posterity. Next to Chip, we have Pete Rafakis, owner of Town Hall. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also say that uh, both Pete and Todd donated some very special beers for tonight, so, and I'll get to that in a second. So he's going to talk about some of the highlights for Town Hall in 2012 and kind of what they're looking forward to in 2013. And last but not least, we have Todd Haug, brewmaster of Surly Brewing Company. And he'll be sharing his take on some of the stuff that happened in 2012 for Surly and what they have to look forward to in 2013. Who would like to start to reflect on the year of 2012? <laughs> Uh, 2012 was a good year. Um, the landscape here in the Twin Cities has changed quite a bit. A lot more breweries. Um, one new brew pub. I think uh, I heard that uh, Smokehouse Brewery was the first brew pub to open in, the tw in Minneapolis for the last 10 years, uh, which was surprising to me. Um, I think when we opened in 97, there was seven or eight brew pubs. Um, and now it is around seven or eight, maybe nine brew pubs. Uh, some have come and some have gone, I suppose. Um, and I, I've heard brew houses, or smokehouse, smokehouse <laughs> is doing very well. They opened uh, maybe three or four months ago. Uh, the brewery has gone through, our brewery, Town Hall, has gone through a lot of uh, changes, mostly behind the scenes. Uh, we've expanded the brewery three times um, in the last two years and twice last year, uh, mostly coolers uh, to give us more storage space. Uh, we've done, probably doubled our production in lagers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we make roughly 50 different types of beer every year. Um, we have five regulars, uh, then we kind of keep a rotating seasonals throughout the, throughout the year. Um, we've got maybe God, I'm going, I'm the wrong guy to speak to about this, but we've got maybe about 10 uh, seasonals that we repeat every year. Uh, 2013, am I just touching on 2012 or? No, you yeah, 2013. 2013, uh, brew pubs in, to grow in, and to expand their markets and serve other, other customers have to uh, distribute to themselves. So a brew pub can go and, and uh, open or buy another retail establishment and then they can deliver their beer to that retail establishment and reach out to different communities. Um, we've done that with a restaurant that we opened in 2010 uh, called Town Hall Tap over on 48th in Chicago. And we just purchased an old bowling alley uh, on 50th and 34th Avenue South that we plan on opening in May or June of this year. Um, thank you. Uh, we finally closed on it right before the holidays and we've started our demo, but we, we anticipate a long process. Uh, the bowling alley was built in uh, the 50s, um, and I don't think any renovation's been done to it since the 50s. Um, so we're starting from scratch and we're, we're very excited about it. Um, I think the rest of the rest of 2013, or well, half of 2013 is going to be getting ready for that. It will include probably another expansion of the brewery. Um, we'll probably add um, three new fermenters and some some other holding tanks, um, and get ready for distribution over to the new space. Jake asked me to come and just kind of talk about home brewing. How many home brewers are in the audience? Oh yeah, all for brew. That's right. <laughs> Chop and brew. Um, so I don't know. To th the hobby seems to have ebb and flows, and you could say that any trend started on any given year. What I feel personally as a home brewer myself and as an ex-employee 
Within the industry, what I saw go big, ironically, in 2012 was going small. Not only volume size, you know, both Northern Brewer and Midwest have one gallon starter kits, but you're just seeing more people looking at things like three gallon brew in a bag, one gallon experiment batches, you know, Seems like a couple of years ago, it was all about getting that 24 gallon Ferminator and you know making more beer than anybody wants to drink and that kind of thing. And now it seems, seems like quantities, not quantity, but number of brews per year has kind of gotten maybe more important than how much you can brew, period. So I saw that happen. But then ironically, large batch projects seem to be big for people. And by that, I mean kind of like barrel, you know, whether it's a club or just a group of people going in on a repurposed barrel or and putting 50 gallons in it or doing like sour blending over X amount of years of a batch or something. So it seems like people are getting together to do really wild and unusual things instead of just having homebrew kind of be this one man or one woman passion in a basement or a garage or a kitchen. It seems like we're we're finding good excuses to get together to do big things. Growth, obviously, as a hobby, as an industry, um, you know, you got the White House, you know, regardless of your politics, the White House having homebrew in it is no joke and really says a lot for the hobby in general, for the DIY character. I think we're supposed to maybe raise a glass. Is this what's going on? 1800, yeah. Raise a glass if you got. 1800 or anything. Cheers! Everybody knows about homebrewing now, so it's kind of like the question for 2013 is what do we do with it almost? I don't know what the answer is to that. Like, how do we get more people into it or more people better at it? <laughs> um, one thing that I did see happen this year, and if you're you know, a home brewer and a fan of the AHA and of the Brewing Network. How many BN Army people in the house? All right. Brewing Network is a radio show that essentially promotes home brewing, talks about recipes, picks apart clones. But what's interesting is the Brewing Network has a club now that has won for two years in a row the American Homebrewers Association Club of the Year. Club of the Year is usually a geographic location. The St. Paul Club owned it for like three years in a row clubs from San Diego win it quite often. But it's a group of people that meet, enter, win a lot of medals, boom, they're the club of the year. What the BN Army is kind of doing, and it's what I think beer in general is benefiting from, is the social media flood that you don't have to, you know, you can get help these days without knowing the guy next door that homebrews. You can get it over the internet, you can get it over the radio, you can tweet and Facebook it. So I think what that's doing is breaking a lot of boundaries of geography for beer, regardless if that's a good or bad thing as well. You know, homebrewers are, are pro and con for that. But it's pretty cool to see there's no, there's no boundary for what you can do style experimentally, and there's no boundary for where you can live and do this, you know? Yeah, and I just think the other thing is Younger, I think the homebrewers are getting younger. They're getting hipper. That may be part of the social media. I feel like there's a lot more couples and even families getting involved in it. Women specifically, Barley Angels, what, what? So it's, I feel like it's getting much more inclusive. Um, and that's definitely a good thing. The 2012 has been an interesting year for us. We're uh, obviously building a new facility, or, or starting to, or trying to, I should say. Um, and a uh, number of roadblocks have been been at every step, um, which I guess at the end of the day is great. You know, you, you did. If it was easy, I don't know that any of us would be here doing this. Whether you homebrew or have a brew pub, whatever, it's not easy. Um, it's a lot easier to go to the liquor store and buy some beer, right, than it is making your own. But at the end, you know, when you when the product's done and uh, the work is done, it really pays off. So. I think that's why we're all here and while we're still here I think that's kind of what Chip was alluding to is it's um, it's not going away I, there's a lot of people that are not critical of the craft beer industry right now but maybe uh, analysts that don't understand it because they're not home brewers they're not into beer they're just analyzing something and they might see it as a trend because it's a pretty aggressive spike but um, I, I don't think any of us are gonna like someday just go ah, I'm not into beer anymore I'm just gonna. I'm serious. I mean, it sounds silly, but people do that with music all the time. 
there's other things that are trends, clothing, uh, whatever. Um, but I think beer, it's intrinsically local. It's um, the small scale thing is huge and it's gonna continue to be huge. I don't think you can have a vibrant scene like we do now um, without having small breweries, a lot of home brewers, and everything. So, you know, when I'd go to Portland, Seattle 20 years ago, I'd just be freaking out about how many beers there were and how cool it was. Then I'd come back here, and there are Shells and Summit, which is great beers, but it's like there's no depth. There's no variety. Yeah, not every brewery out in Seattle was great. didn't matter. There were still 30 of them. So that's kind of the idea, and I think we're heading that direction. And... As we're going, it's it's interesting for you know me and Pete to joke up here uh, about how things have changed over the years. It's it's pretty dramatic um, from when he first started his brewery and when I first got in the industry. I'm not going to say how long ago, um, but I worked at Summit when I was 21 and uh, I was a home brewer and got a job there helping out on the bottling line, um, putting bottles into those old six packs that you had to fold by hand. There's no machine that can do that. Um, so to come this far is pretty amazing and to be a part of it, it's, it's a, a huge source of pride for me um, since I grew up here and to go all over the country now and people are excited about this town because of its beer. And then you add all the other cool stuff about the cities and it's, it's awesome. So some of the roadblocks are there, but with all that going on, it's just like, ah, it's just another thing me and Omar got to figure out, or um, whatever it is, it's, it's, uh, we'll figure it out kind of thing. So that's our mentality this year is, is we have no idea what we're doing. We've got a lot of good help, um, but it's going to take us a little bit, and it's worth it. We still got room to grow. We've been growing every year. People are, the people that I guess that don't understand how breweries operate is you can't just turn the switch that says the more beer switch. Um, or you can't just put an ad in the paper and have brewers at your doorstep. They need to be trained. They need to fit in because it's a small community. Um, you know, you don't want people, people don't get along in the brew house. It, it makes oftentimes for not good beer in a small brewery. Um, so I think that's one thing, but also we grow every year. We've got tanks coming this year again. We had six new fermenters come online last year. We've got six coming this year. And this is all leading into the new facility that will hopefully uh, open 2014, middle of 2014. Um, so we've been busy planning. So it's not we're not super public with all of it because a lot of it's just planning and it's just that. It's not not solid information yet. Um, but we are still we're growing. We're hope, hoping to grow 30 to 50 percent next year in production. Um, keep the beer in Minnesota hopefully, and uh, um, kind of see what Minnesota can, can handle from, uh, from us as far as uh, annual production and see how hungry they are for the styles of beers we make. Um, and then next year is going to be um, building and hopefully commissioning the new brew house. Well, I think one thing's for sure, and this is a topic that we've talked about a little bit. It's a subject we've touched on from different guests, whether it was uh, Lanny Hoff or Hansi or uh, Chris German from BSG. I mean, all these people that come through the industry, they all talk about growth. And they all talk about how to manage that growth right now, and not only on a na nationwide scale, but here in the Twin Cities. And one of the things I'd like to ask all of you, and get your individual opinions on, is being that you guys are some veterans and some figureheads within the local scene, you've been on the national scene, obviously. Both of you guys have won medals. You've been a part of great breweries and uh, and have reputations that definitely transcend the Twin Cities. Uh, Town Hall and certainly I think are the biggest names outside of, of Minnesota, in my personal opinion. Chip, obviously you've traveled the country extensively, visiting breweries and looking at the homebrew scene. What is the reputation of the Twin Cities in Minnesota on the national scene right now? I think it's, you know, it's strong. It's building, these two guys specifically have been, you know, cornerstones of it. Um, as a beer trader, I know I get more and more requests for beers from here, nerd or thief. Um, but it's cool, and it's cool, regardless of what the reputation is, it's cool to finally have that. You know, every year it seems like there's two or three more, like, excellent beers to add to that list whereas in the past it's been kind of like if you've never had it it's different but I don't you know I don't know if it's worth what you're sending me 
not hating, just being real. But uh, I think the solidity of the beers is getting stronger. I think more people know that when they come here, they're going to find, like you say, from Summit in 86 all the way up to Dangerous Man, like negative blank days and counting, people are expecting really good beer. And the beauty is, hopefully, it'll get to be much like a tourist destination. We say that a lot, but it's getting to the point where you could really spend a couple of days, do big tours, little tours. I know a guy that knows the password to get in to see the brewery. So I think it's peaking interest nationwide, no matter what, for sure. I think Chip is right. I, the other thing that I'd like to touch on is, is the kind of the global nature of where things are going with the internet and with the radio show that you're talking about is is there's people that can tell people uh, whether it's rate beer or beer advocate or some other other avenue on the internet about our beer whereas you can only get our beer here um, so the traders we actually uh, owe you some gratitude there uh, not a lot but uh, um, I think, I think it's done wonders for us. I, I think that uh, when I get on one of those sites and I read about our beers, I think it's fantastic. Um, for the most part, they've been positive, which is it's good and a, a testament to our brewing staff. Um, but that's shrunk the world, so it, it's brought some notoriety to Minneapolis um, and, and the rest of the state. I think the other thing that's important is, is the GABF. I, when we go out to the GABF, and we've been going for 17, 15 years now, and uh, winning medals is great, and I, I think that's helped our reputation. Um, I, when Todd won a medal out there, I think that helped his reputation. I was kind of in their early stages at Surly. And now we see some of the head brewers, and I'm, I'm not sure whether you or Omar inv are involved in this, but uh, I know Dave Hoops at Fitkers is now a judge out at, at GABF. And I think it's important for people within the industry in Minnesota and the Midwest in general to become judges out there. And you see a lot of, you see a lot of um, medals going, well, back in the old days, you saw a ton of them going to Colorado, to California, to Washington. And a lot of the judges were from out that way. And I'm, I'm not saying, it's not biased, it's a, it's a, um, a blind tasting. But we have different tastes here, and we prefer our beers a certain way. And I know Mike Hoops, our brewer, we don't try to cater our beers to fit a style to win a medal. Uh, but it's nice for a judge to go out there and taste the type of beer that we're making and, and recognize that as fitting a style. And that's another thing that's kind of shrinking. If, if we can get more representation within our region out at different uh, festivals, uh, the GABF or the World Beer Cup, I think that helps our cause. Um, <clears throat> I come from a little bit different perspective because I don't see daily um, drinkers of our beer. Um, but I do see their di distribution side of it. And I know a lot of breweries and distributors um, distributors in this town, but also the breweries that are not in this town that want to sell their beer here are pretty excited about this market. Um, as you can tell by all the new beer, I mean, literally seven years ago, the, what was available out of state was completely pretty tiny compared to what it is now. It's exploded, uh, which I think is great. But the cool thing now for me is that a lot of those breweries are like, oh, it's not as great as I, we thought it would be or because everyone is so into the local beers right now. So, um, which is great. You know, I, I, I never recommend any homerism or, or just turn a blind eye to quality or anything, but um, it is great to see local neighborhoods embracing small, tiny breweries. Um, and you know, it's some breweries that are big hitters out around this country that come here and they're like, oh, it's not, it's not that great. Well, that's because people are drinking fresh local beer and I think for now, that's more important than buying, you know, whatever beer from California, for example. So, um, so I think that's almost outpacing the craft beer drinkers here right now. But it's going to catch up. I mean, I think every day there's a lot of people turning 21. But we have a, an amazing. We had, me and Omar had no idea that the demographic is as wide as ours is. Um, we have people that are retirement age that love our beer we have people that are just turned 21 that are freaking out about our beer which we never ever expected we thought it'd be that middle demographic 30 to 35 
Um, kind of been around craft beer for 10 years maybe, but wanted something different. It has turned out to be completely not that. So, um, which is exciting. And a lot of, lot of breweries all over the world see that. And there, there's only going to be more exciting beer coming into this market because everybody supported it. So I think that's great. Todd, I'm going to piggyback on that comment about how wide open that demographic, the market is huge. It's everybody from 21 to 81. How is the consumer, how do you think, it, will, the, will the consumer inform the beers that you guys make in 2013 and moving forward? Is their palate changing or is that shift in the market demanding a different beer? Well, for maybe an established brewery, it might have an impact. And I think it should. I mean, I think it, whatever it is, music, arts, theater, whatever, I think they need to be challenged and kind of rethink what they're doing and what, they ever, what their whole intentions were, whether they're five years old or 100 years old. Um, but I don't think any of us brew that way. You know, so there's kind of this, this thing. It's like me and Mike at Town Hall have been brewing the beers we, we want to make for years. It's never been that people demand it. It's never, ever been that. Occasionally, you might make a beer that a bunch of people really like, but there's always beers that we make for us that a lot of people really like and they're really good, but it's never going to hit that, that wide audience. So I think what's hopefully happening is people can actually appreciate an IPA and then maybe appreciate a delicate mild or something. I'm hoping. That's always been my hope. So um, eventually, I think there'll be people will be able to have like normal adult conversations about this beer that's got a ton of hops crammed into it. And they like it, but then they can actually appreciate something, a lager or anything else. So I, hopefully, it's it's widening so that those styles, if you want to call it that, those beer flavors, if that's getting wider, that just allows us to do more of what we love to do and create flavors, whether it's whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So I think it's actually the, the net's getting wider versus the other way. I don't care, I know everybody keeps saying Minnesota's crazy about hops, and yeah, they are, but so is every other country, or excuse me, every other city in this. I mean, we were out uh, in Norway not too long ago, and they're freaking out about hops. All the breweries in Scandinavia are mimicking American hoppy styles. So that's kind of this trend, it's not just here, it's not Minnesota-centric. A lot of people apparently favor hops and they like bitterness. I don't know if it's a human palate thing or if it's just a discovery thing, but hopefully the goal is that everybody, they can appreciate that along with malty, along with sour, along with both. I think the more experience a beer drinker has and, and classes like this allows people to get introduced to different styles of beer. Um, you know, they may get turned to a craft beer because of the hoppiness of it. Um, but they always want to experience new things. I mean, that's the way I am with everything. And, and I, I think Todd and, and Mike do a great job in, in getting the types of beer that they, they think are important to people to taste and allow people to have the different experiences. So I agree. I, I know Mike doesn't brew to what other people think. And uh, if he was here, he'd be just nodding his head, I think. Um, but, uh, and I, I think that's the way to attack it. I, I think that the more experience you have as a beer drinker, the more you're gonna wanna taste different styles. And like I said earlier, we've trended toward doing more lagers in the brew house. And part of it is we have more equipment and we're, we're able to store beer for longer periods of time. And part of it is it's because Mike wants to experiment with lockers and we see other people changing over and hopping over into the craft beer market that want to drink lagers and that have been in the, in the, the I don't know, industrial style beers category for such a long time, but they want to experience what everyone else is going crazy over. So we just kind of wean them off their industrial style beers and we're making more lagers, light lagers, and then we push the envelope with some of the other things like a Baltic Porter and things like that. Uh, with home brewing specifically, kind of the best of both worlds. A, you don't have to answer to anybody but yourself. So if you want to make five gallons of jalapeno infused pine cone, <laughs> dry rub saged Russian Imperial Stout, do that shit, man. You're the only one that's gonna drink it anyway. But but so you got you've got that, and someone else will drink it with you if you're. Um, yeah, if you, your cat in the basement will drink it with you. 
don't tell your mom it's 18% alcohol. Yeah, but really, you know, so the experimentation's there, and you don't have to answer anybody. But ironically, you know, people go the opposite way with it, too. If you're any homebrewer here knows, you know, it's awesome to experiment, but it's also awesome to peg a style and to have other people drink it and be like, world-class example of a style brewed at your house. So it kind of, I think it ebbs and flows, and I know that I'll brew wacky for a while, and then I'll just get burned out on it, and I will find the most simple, most popular, traditional recipe for style X, and I'll brew it. And I might brew it a couple times to see what I can come up with. So obviously you can't sell your beer as a home brewer, so it's not so much about... <laughs> So it's not so much about meeting demand as uh, kind of defying your own expectations or defying your own talent level. So on that side, you know, do what you want. So we've got a national reputation that is in the graces right now. This is definitely a place where other breweries want to be. This is definitely a place where people recognize that great beer is being made. The AHA has recognized the Twin Cities as the number one city to be in as a home brewer, which is no surprise to me. Um, so it has the healthiest homebrew scene. It's got an incredible craft beer scene. It's got a ton of brewing history. So in 2013, as we see that market increase, as we see the public wanting more beer, do you guys think that the state and the cities and the other municipalities are going to be more open to changes in legislation and or changes in the way they treat brewing or beer related uh, uh, businesses. Don't have to get into specific legislation, <laughs> but just in general, do you think the state is becoming more receptive to that? <laughs> um. I think they're more receptive until, uh, I mean, you can get in the door. I, you know, I started the fight for brew pubs and breweries, I think, maybe six years ago, and it was hard to get in the door. So it was hard to get in to see someone. And then when you'd go and sit down and talk to a legislator, you had a half an hour. They were generally late, so that turned it to 25 minutes. And then they didn't know what the hell you were talking about. So they didn't know the laws. Um, You'd spend about 20 minutes just explaining what you could and could not do. And then you'd try to get into what you wanted to do. So I think that's changed quite a bit now. Uh, they generally see who's, who they're meeting with. They tend to be on time a little bit more. Um, they know the law. Um, and then they're receptive. Um, about a, a month after you start talking to them, then politics starts happening. And then it gets really interesting. I, uh, the, the, I, I've never been more disappointed in the process until I went through it and realized the politics involved. And I know it's politics, but uh, it, was, it was frustrating. Um, I, do I think there will always be politics? Yes. And there's people, people and organizations that are significantly more powerful than the breweries that are here now. Um, I think the organizations that are starting to start on a grassroots level, including the Craft Brewers Guild, are slowly becoming more powerful. Um, and with that, if the breweries, and I'll lump ourselves as a brew pub into that category, can come with a common theme, I think the guild will become more powerful and laws will get changed. Whether that's not, well, I won't even predict that. 2013, that's gonna be hard to do. But within the next few years, I think, I think that's possible. Um, I think the, when, when I started, I had a lot of gusto, and I, I went in and, and guns blazing, trying to get things changed, thought things would happen. That I always thought, I always, I talked to Mike Hoops about it, and it was always, man, this is logical, isn't it? It should just, should just happen. I can't, can't believe it's not happening. And then you hit those roadblocks, and I think that, that at this point, the logic is starting to sink in with people, and the people that are the people and organizations that oppose us see their fight more difficult every year. Um, so they play other games in trying to dissuade you from putting up that fight. 
and as as Todd and, and Omar could probably attest, that fight's a, I mean, it's a battle. It takes a lot out of you. You, you go there every week or every day on certain occasions, every month, whatever, what have you. And uh, they're not fun talks. They're, your, your blood pressure goes up, it goes down, it goes up, goes down, you argue. Um, and I'd rather push a pencil any day or, or <laughs> brew beer or what, whatever you want to do. So I think, I think things will change. And the more we can get the consumers behind us, and I, I think that the Surly Bill is what happened. Um, I think there's a lot of things that need to be changed. And people talk about being a destination brewery place. Um, I, if you're bored, go look up the laws of Colorado, and then you'll see what we're after. Yeah, um, they don't, I'm not allowed to talk to those people, uh, which, is, which is probably best, because um, I'd actually tell them what I think, and then I won't vote for them. But honestly, it's, there's a lot of... There's a lot more important things to, for them to be worrying about. And if we could just get through this really basic um, adult stuff, they can go worry about that busy stuff, you know, that more important stuff like healthcare, or whatever, schools, um, government stuff. I don't, they shouldn't really be protecting distributors, in my opinion. Um, and that's kind of what it comes down to for me. Now you can see why they don't let me talk to them. Um, because it is about that. It's the politics. It has nothing to, I hate to say it, it has nothing to do with us. Um, it has to do with these companies that make a lot of money as middlemen that distribute a product um, that hobble everything Pete wants to do and what I want to do. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to need distributors. We're not, we don't want to cut distributors out. We just want the option, or Pete just wants the option. Um, so we would love, we're going we're gonna to have a distributor shortly. So it's not like we're talking about completely not using that system, but uh, it's put in place a long time ago to protect us, and uh, I don't think it's protecting anyone. It's just actually kind of limiting our business. Um, the good news is a couple things have changed over the years. The growler law a long time ago, back before any of you were probably 21. Um, maybe not. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, the Surly Bill, which Omar did, uh, which was huge. Uh, with you know, Omar was that was horrible. I got to tell you, that was the, the this is worse than trying to build a new brewery. It was him coming home, coming back to the brewery home for, uh, after being at the Capitol and just completely beat up in tears. Like, yeah, it was it was rough. It's not easy there. People even told him, you don't you don't just come to the Capitol your first year and expect to get stuff done. And I'm, which which really made me mad. Um, but anyway, so he had, he had the right people. Pete's right that, that it was really the, the consumers, the people that made their voices heard by calling their legislators. And that's what it's going to continue to take. It's just going to, we got to hammer them every year. Home brewing beer at your home, home brewing beer at your home, is currently legal in Minnesota. So you have no reason to not be doing it if you think you're interested. Because in Mississippi and Alabama, there's plenty of people doing it, but they're not actually protected by the law. There are places in this country they're still telling you you cannot ferment beer, mead, and wine at your house. So if you're at all interested, you should celebrate your freedom, celebrate your vices, and do this. It's awesome. Um, shameless plug, if you want to see how stupid a lot of lawmakers are when thinking about things like home brewing, and this can probably correlate to craft beer, if you're taking notes, YouTube Alabama homebrew debate. Anybody ever seen it? I put this video together while we were still working at Northern Brewer and Brewing TV, and it is a real quick montage of politicians from both sides of the aisle. I'm not pointing any finger. And it is some of the most misinformed, antiquated, making a joke about something that is other people's passion that you'll ever hear. You'll punch your computer screen, and then your face. So I just want to add to that. Uh, uh, one of the things that's important to know, I just talked about this last week at a different event. We were talking about legislation, and we were talking about homebrewing legislation now. It's still illegal in Mississippi and Alabama, although it's illegal federally. But beer is regulated at a state level. So homebrewing is also regulated at a state level. Just about a year and a half ago, uh, they interpreted the statutes in Wisconsin 
and the statutes on the book in Wisconsin are, are almost identical to the ones on, in Minnesota, that homebrew could not be moved from the place of its creation. That was the interpretation. And that was different from the interpretation they'd had of it since 1978 when homebrewing was legalized by Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter. Um, so at that point, they say, yeah, you can brew in your own home and you can share it with your family and friends, but you can't take it out of the house. You can't take it over to your buddy's house. You can't take it to this homebrew competition. You can't take it to the bar, whatever it might be. So effectively, they shut down all the homebrew competitions. It caused a big uproar. Um, the AHA got involved, homebrew shops got involved, homebrew clubs got involved, and two new bills were passed. One overturning that statute, changing the language to allow homebrew to be moved from the place of its creation. And another, another bill passed with less opposition and faster to allow homebrew shops to serve homebrew samples at their stores, which was unprecedented. That, there's no other state where that's allowed at least on the books. So, and, and I was, I went to Madison, Wisconsin several times, flew out there, testified in front of the, the, the you know, the Senate committee or what it might be. And it was a, at that point, it was sort of a pro-jobs bill. And at that time, Governor Walker wasn't doing so well in the state. So anything that was pro-business or pro-jobs, pretty much nobody wanted to get in the way of it. And it passed super quickly. So. Like these guys have been touching on, I just want to add that the climate of politics is its own climate. And it has no bearing on common sense or logic <laughs> at all. At all. You guys as consumers might think, why can't we change this? Well, it's because the climate that we all live in, that 99% of the people live in, isn't the climate that that 1% lives in. It's a, it's a different show when you get it to that political stage. So. What I, what I urge you guys to do is to speak your voice, contact your legislation, you know, tell them what you're thinking because they will listen to the people because the one thing that they do care about, getting reelected. And if they think that that's in jeopardy, they'll listen. So you guys do have power. I know sometimes it seems like you don't have power, but you do have power because that is what they listen to. So that's my two cents. Sorry, I had to put that in there. <laughs> And everybody, I want to give a big round of applause for our guests tonight, Todd, Pete, and Chip. Once again, I want to thank Surly and Town Hall for donating these amazing beers tonight. You guys had a real treat. A big cheers to Republic for hosting us this semester and all their staff. A huge thank you and cheers to all of our volunteers that have served you beers throughout the semester. And last but not least, a thank you to Rob Shellman of Better Beer Society for making this all happen. And again, look for information about the next semester on betterbeersociety.com and our Facebook page for Better Beer Society University. We'll be kicking things up in uh, early March. So uh, until then, be safe, enjoy beer, and be kind to each other. And boo for all.